Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you might be in the world. I am Andres Velasco. I am the Dean of the School of Public Policy here at the LSE, and I would like to welcome you to our online event entitled Knowledge Diffusion as a Cornerstone of Economic Recovery in the Post-COVID World. Our event today is hosted by the Growth Lab at Harvard Kennedy School and the LSE School of Public Policy. I am very, very happy to be chairing this event today. And uh, I particularly want, want to welcome our speakers. We have an incredible lineup of speakers. We are very lucky and very proud that they have joined us today. And I will be introducing each one of them uh, in just a second. Um, this event has a particular purpose. Uh, of course, we will be discussing development and knowledge and many issues related to those two, but uh, it is also uh, a launch. It is an event to mark the launch of the Growth Collab at the LSE, uh, which is a new strategic collaboration between the Growth Lab at the Harvard Kennedy School and the School of Public Policy at the LSE. The two institutions have come together to combine expertise, knowledge, experience, and of course, the talent that comes from the faculty of two of the world's leading social science institutions. Before I introduce speakers, let me just make a couple of housekeeping announcements. If you're tweeting, the hashtag for today's event is of course, hashtag, hashtag sorry, LSE post COVID. The event is being recorded and it will be made avail available um, as a podcast uh, soon. No firm date, but soon. After uh, the speakers are done with presentations, we will open it up to the floor for a Q&A uh, and a period. So please pose your questions in the chat and I will try to read as many as possible given time constraints to our speakers today. So let me now... Um, turn to the wonderful people who are going to be joining us in this conversation. And I will mention them in the order in which they will um, take the floor. First will be Miguel Angel Santos, who is a distinguished policy fellow here at the LSE, at the School of Public Policy, and who is the brand new director of the Growth Collab at the LSE. Following Miguel will be my dear friend uh, uh, and former colleague, Professor Ricardo Hausman, who of course is a professor at the Kennedy School and the director and founder many years ago of the Harvard Growth Lab. We will then be very, very lucky to hear for about seven minutes each from, and again, I will uh, introduce them um, and say a little bit about them in the order in which they will take the floor. Anne Bernstein, who is the head of the Center for Development and Enterprise in South Africa. This is an independent think tank uh, and arguably, and I can say because I've been there, uh, probably South Africa's leading development policy center, focusing on jobs, growth, educated, education, sorry, cities, and the role of business. Next, we were very honored to welcome Arbe, um, Arben Ahmetaj, who is the Deputy Prime Minister of Albania and Minister of State for Reconstruction and Reform. Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, we're very, very honored that you're joining us today. Honor Next job. is um, Isabel uh, de San Malo, who is a former vice president of Panama. Uh, Isabel was the first woman elected vice president and also the first woman appointed minister of foreign affairs of her native country, Panama. And last but certainly not least, we are delighted to be joined today by Dr. Omar Al-Razaz, who is the former prime minister of Jordan. As you can see, I was not exaggerating when I mentioned that we have an extraordinary lineup. And once again, many, many thanks to all of you for joining us today. Without further ado, I am going to hand it over first to Miguel Santos and then to Ricardo Hausman for their opening remarks. Ricardo and Miguel, actually Miguel first, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Andres. I've, I've worked at the Growth Lab in Harvard University for eight years. During those eight years, I was fortunate enough to work in Jordan with uh, Prime Minister al Razaz and also in, in Panama with Vice President Isabel de San Malo. Not lucky enough to work in Albania, which is one of the most successful 
projects of, of, the, of the Harvard Growth Lab. And I'm, I'm here today to devote just a few minutes to talk about what, what's our strategic goal in creating the Growth Lab or creating a, a Growth Co-Lab at the London School of Economics. And the goal is just, in principle, we just wanted to bring together the capacities, expertise, and reach of two top academics institutions to expand the growth lab activities at the global level. The growth labs, and I think Ricardo will, will refer to this later, has become one of the world's leading research centers for policies aimed at accelerating sustainable and inclusive growth. And, and it's a unique place. And, and what makes the growth lab a unique place, it's the combination of, of top-notch academic research that has enabled the lab to push the economic frontiers of knowledge and economic growth and development with a deep concern for having a real impact. It's a permanent drive that characterizes the Growth Lab uh, since the very outset for forcing people to translate insights of research into actionable policies and tools that policymakers can use to make better decisions. And in the process, to build the next generation of research-driven policy analysts and policy leaders. In the end, we're hosted at the Harvard Kennedy School and at the London School of Public Policy, which are schools aiming at form the next generation of leaders. Uh, three of the speakers joining us today belong to countries where the Growth Lab has partnered with governments when they were in office at different points in time, and you will hear from them. What are we aiming specifically to achieve at the, with the Growth Co-Lab at LSE? Following our philosophy, the way we view the world, we are aiming at tapping into diverse sources of knowledge and thought partners because we believe that prosperity is not the result of places knowing more, but of places knowing different, commanding different types of know-how and being able to pull that know-how together. So we're going to leverage the experience and the unique relationship between the, the CoLab and the Harvard Growth Lab to engage LSE faculty and students and offer them the possibility of joining cutting edge research teams, cross staff across Harvard and LSE translate their outputs into policies and give them the opportunity to learn from the process of implementation. So we wanna provide students in growth, interested in growth and development with an enhanced experience, which includes coursework, capstone projects, research assistantships, internships, and as we grow, potential jobs for graduates from LSE. We're also meaning to engage multiple thought partners that are located closer to Europe because our research has documented that in spite of all the possibilities offered by the virtual world, proximity matters. And our proximity to organizations that share our concern for better policy making and improving living standards of people, such as British academia, European academia more broadly, multilateral institutions such as the European Union, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, bilateral institutions and philanthropic foundations, will help us to come up and conceive opportunities for collaboration and joint work, which were not evident from Boston. So what have we done already? We have already started an academic course on growth diagnostic, <laughs> a framework that fittingly was pioneered by Ricardo and Andres to help countries prioritize scarce resources, scarce state capacity and policy attention, and focus on areas that have the potential to deliver the highest impact. The, the growth diagnostic framework has enhanced and improved by more than 15 years of deployment within the Growth Lab and has now become part of the toolkit of international financial and multilateral institutions. So this year, I'm about to finish next week, the first cohort of the growth diagnostic class at the School of Public Policy of LSE. And we are already in talks with the school to duplicate the size of the class for next year. And this summer, Four selected students for the School of Public Policy at LSE will be participating in the Growth Lab internship programs. They will be going to Namibia, working side by side with government officials in that country to push forward the work that has derived from a research engagement in that country that it's now two years old and one more to go. Um, so that's what we're up to. I want to thank once again, everybody joining us today, the honorable speakers, the chair, and invite you all to join our efforts and become part of this uh, super exciting journey, which is the journey of putting people together with different skills to think rigorously about the world's most compelling challenges, to design and mobilize support to their proposed solutions, 
and to learn from the process of implementation and in the making to shape the next generation of policy leaders. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, I, can, I can attest uh, to the uh, <laughs> extraordinary enthusiasm of those LSE students who will be doing work uh, in different countries of the world. Um, so wonderful research and policy work that benefits countries, but also an important benefit to our students. Uh, I guess that's what people call a win-win uh, kind of arrangement. Ricardo, over to you. Well, thank you, Andres. <clears throat> it's really a, a very happy moment here, this uh, launching of uh, the Growth Call Lab at the LSE. <clears throat> Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about the Growth Lab. Um, I think the seeds of the Growth Lab started with a project uh, that uh, we did uh, from the Harvard Kennedy School in El Salvador, where I asked my good friend and colleague Andres Velasco to join me. Uh, and together with Danny Roderick and other colleagues, we, we went to El Salvador. And in the process of engaging in El Salvador, we realized how lousy were the diagnostic tools that we had at hand. And, and we were forced through that engagement to figure out a way to think about the challenges of El Salvador. And we ended up uh, doing reverse engineering of that experience to develop the growth diagnostic uh, methodology. We were very quickly re-engaged uh, in South Africa. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, Andres had the uh, unwise idea to become finance minister of Chile. Uh, and so he left us uh, without his wisdom. Uh, but we went on to, to a very, very um, uh, uh, transformative experience for us uh, uh, engaging in South Africa uh, about 15, 17 years ago now. And, um, and then we went on to do 50 more of those projects in over 30 countries. Um, uh, some of them we've been engaged in the long run. We are still engaged in South Africa. We're still engaged in Albania. In Albania, it's been since uh, 2013. It's now nine years. Um, others have been uh, not as long as a relationship, but uh, very, very meaningful uh, with uh, Panama and Jordan here uh, represented. I really thank um, uh, our, our panelists for uh, agreeing to, to be here. In the process, we really found this tremendous synergy that there is between, you know, fundamental research that, uh, you know, we do when we think abstractly about growth and inclusion and sustainability and stability and so on um, with uh, applied work. The example of El Salvador with Andres was, uh, it was exactly that kind of where you go meet the world, cannot find tools to analyze the world, so you develop tools tools for it, and or then you develop theories about how the world works, and then you go and see the world with those, those eyes. Um, in the process, we also found that it was very beneficial to develop tools that allow other people uh, to view the world with, with those frameworks, with those theories, with those forms of organizing the data of the world and transforming it to information. So the process, we developed the Atlas of Economic Complexity, which is a website that's open to everybody. Uh, and it has had over 1.5 million uh, individual uh, visitors. Um, we are a group of about 50, some 10 postdocs, some 30 applied research fellows, uh, the people who develop our, our digital tools like the Atlas. We also have a new Atlas of, of cities that is called Metroverse, like a metropolitan universe that I encourage you to Google and, and visit. Um, and so, so that's that's um, that's what we have become. Um, in in the process, it has made us think uh, very hard about uh, the relationship between public policy and the foundational sciences, say like economics, political science, or or psychology. In some sense, uh, you want to think that um, public policy is about changing the world in the same way as science is about understanding how the world is and technology is about changing the world to take the form that we want it to be. So we have physics departments and we have engineering schools. We have biology departments and we have medical schools, but engineering is not just physics and medicine is not just biology. 
If these things become a thing into themselves, they answer different questions. They need a whole set of methodologies and tools and, and techniques to, to, to act on the world. And I think public, public policy has that. Its relationship to economics or political science should be a little bit like the relationship of engineering to physics or medicine to, to biology. But then you ask yourself, how do we train, say, medical doctors? Well, in the US, they send them, they, they require four years of college uh, where they take some the so-called pre-med courses in, you know, in biology, microbiology, organic chemistry, and so on. And then you send them for four years to a medical school. At Harvard, those four years are constituted by one year in the classroom and three years in teaching hospitals. And in order to do its thing, Harvard has 16 affiliated teaching hospitals. So the way we conceive of ourselves as the growth lab is that we are a teaching and research hospital. We have real patients that are facing real issues. Uh, we do basic research to try to analyze the kinds of problems we find in the world and applied research to try to understand and diagnose the specific conditions of, of, of the patient. And, <clears throat> and in the process, uh, we work with uh, junior uh, uh, professionals that get formed and trained in the process of working at a teaching hospital. So that's our philosophy. That's, that's the way we, we view ourselves. That's, that's how we think of our organization. We do research, we do uh, uh, teaching, but we also uh, uh, deal with patients that we are trying to, uh, to help and cure. <clears throat> uh, our take on development is that a lot of development is about technology adoption. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, science is sort of like about knowledge about the nature of the world. Technology is about knowledge of how to change the world. Now, technology takes uh, three forms. It takes the form of tools, machines, uh, equipment, materials. That's what we call embodied knowledge. It's crystallized in those, in those goods. It takes the form of codes, recipes, formulas, how to do manuals, uh, protocols, algorithms. And in that form, it takes some, the form is some symbolic codes uh, that can be transmitted easily uh, through uh, as information. And it takes the form of know-how that is tacit knowledge in brains that exists in brains and only in brains. Tools and codes are easy to move around. And if uh, technology was only tools and codes, we would create an, an NGO that would, you know, send tools to poor places and put codes on the web and share them with everybody and the world would be flat. But unfortunately, to implement technology, you need tools and codes, but you also need the know-how, not just of one person that knows how to do everything, but of many people that know different things that have to come together to implement that technology. <clears throat> so so know-how, and especially team know-how, collective know-how, is at the core of the ability of a place, a society, a region, a city <clears throat> to implement technology. It is very difficult to move know-how into brains. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell likes to say that it takes 10,000 hours to become good at something. And 10,000 10, hours at 40 hours a week is almost five years. So it takes a long time to move know-how into brains, much more than moving tools and codes. And so know-how can easily become the binding constraint on the accumulation of, of technology, in the improvements of productivity, in the raising of, of income levels. Um, it takes a lot of effort to move know-how into brains. It's remarkably simple to move brains. So the mobility of humans has been fundamental to the diffusion of technology. Uh, the mobility of humans between firms, um, founders of Ford General Motors and Chrysler all work for Oldsmobile. Uh, the founders of many, many of the firms of Silicon Valley all work for Fairchild Semiconductors. So it was uh, the movement of brains between firms, between regions, you can also document that, between countries, there's been excellent uh, research on uh, migration of people uh, between countries, uh, of the role of diasporas in helping the home country acquire capabilities and technologies that were not there before, and the role of return migration in, in transforming things. I'm proud to have 
co-authored a paper on return migration in Albania that found really remarkable effects. In, in my mind, uh, many countries in the developing world have enormous restrictions to migration and to immigration, and especially to skilled immigration. Uh, the world has talked a lot about you know, uh, migration from poor country to rich countries, but really developing countries have enormous barriers to immigration and in particular to high-skilled immigration. So um, this is an issue that we've had to uh, deal with and, and, and analyze in the context of Jordan, in the context of Panama, in the context of South Africa, in the context of Albania all countries represented uh, in this panel by my very, very dear uh, friends. Uh, we've <clears throat> had to analyze a bunch of other issues in, in those countries and worked on a lot, other, a, a lot of other reforms. But I think that uh, I wanted to, to stress the importance we gave to, to uh, um, uh, the mo movement of uh, humans in the process of technology diffusion and the role of technology diffusion in sustainable and inclusive growth. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward uh, to uh, the distinguished panelists uh, uh, that uh, have honored with us with their presence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, as you can see, the uh, track record of the uh, Growth Lab is pretty impressive both in terms of intellectual innovation and in terms of actual impact. Uh, I am very, very honored on a personal note that it all started with one visit to San Salvador, I don't know, 20 years ago. And I will say that I've borrowed many uh, ideas from my dear friend Ricardo. One of the ones that I have used and abused the most is this notion that you know, schools of public policies are the med school of a university or the engineering school of a university. You know, I'm the dean of a school of public policy and I'm often asked, what is that? Um, what do you teach? Uh, how is it different from economics or political science? And Ricardo, as here as in many other areas, has provided, I think, exactly the right uh, answer to thank Ricardo for that. I am going to turn to our four amazing speakers. They have all very kindly agreed to tell us a little bit about their experience working with the CoLab and um, or with the Growth Lab initially, and now we hope with the CoLab, uh, and maybe reflect also on the virtues uh, and shortcomings, if any, uh, of this approach, and of course on any other policy issue that may be keeping them up at night nowadays. And surely there are plenty of those out there in the world today. And I'm going to begin with Anne Bernstein. So Anne. The next seven minutes are yours. And again, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be part of this prestigious panel and to be part of the launch of what in South Africa we would call an Anglo-American cooperation. <laughs> um, and as Ricardo and you think about expanding your empire, perhaps you'll consider a, a university in the developing world next time. Uh, to add to the map in, yes. of where the Growth Lab is going to be headquartered. So We're all from the developing world. Sorry, <laughs> that's true, but you all live in the rich world, or, you know, so big difference, big difference. Um, so South Africa, I think, is one of Ricardo's recalcitrant patients. <laughs> and although at the moment we're trying very hard to expand and deepen his influence on the government of the day and the future of the country. Uh, I can speak for my think tank to say that Ricardo has had an enormous influence on how we see growth and the, the messages that we put out into South Africa uh, as effectively as we can. But let me start with a story, again learned from Ricardo, um, which is about South Africa. In the 17th century, a small group of people left France, fleeing from religious persecution, and they came to the Cape. And these were the Huguenots, who in their brains and in their families brought the, the knowledge and ability to grow wine, to make wine. And so from this small group of people, about 100, maybe 200 people, over a 20 year period, South Africa now has a world-class wine industry. 
and many of the the brands you will see in your shops around the world bear French names. So this is a perfect example of what Ricardo is talking about. The whole issue of skills in South Africa is very complex. We're a country which has probably the world's worst and deepest unemployment crisis. Um, globally, about 60% of the workforce in most countries are actually working. In South Africa today, after COVID, it's less than 40%. So it's a, we're a dramatically negative outlier. On the other hand, we're a country that is desperately short of skills. Now, many people in, in our country don't really appreciate the, the relationship between the two, that the more skilled people you have, the more entrepreneurs you have, the more jobs you will create. And if we could fix our laws, we would get more and more jobs, not just for skilled people, but for un unskilled people. Uh, so this is a very tense issue and one that we've tried to influence rather unsuccessfully to open the country to skilled immigrants. Um, it's hard to make the case often as to how skilled immigrants could really turbo boost growth in a country like South Africa. And we, we have an absurd policy, in my view, where we have what is called a critical skills list, where people use the data from last year to try and guess or what skills the country will need for the next two or three years. And this is crazy, in my view, in a dynamic, expanding 21st century economy. So we, we, we see this the wrong way altogether. Um, I personally think we should have a different kind of list, which is who are the people you don't want in the country? It would be very short. It would be terrorists. It would be criminals and sort of people who claim to have fake qualifications. So, but as of yet, this is not uh, public policy. In fact, we have an absurd situation at the moment where we have an organization where business and organized labor and government get together to negotiate policies for growth. And last year, they released one of their background documents and I was stunned to discover that in a country that is desperate for growth, we have a stagnant economy, we have a fiscal crisis, we desperately need faster growth. You had this bizarre situation of business and government and labor essentially horse trading over what skills they were going to allow into the country for economic growth. Absurd. We all know that we need all sorts of skills for South Africa and Ricardo has made this case and perhaps we need to remake it again in the growth labs work in South Africa over the next 18 months as to the unbelievable importance of just expanding our doors to bring maths teachers, to bring medical specialists, to bring university lecturers, to bring many more entrepreneurs to find much more generously than our current legislation to people from Africa and elsewhere who have entrepreneurial experience but are not necessarily big companies. We need startups, we need all sorts of things to help grow our economy so that it can become much more inclusive. So, so this is a really complex issue. We have some, I think, very restrictive laws where if you come into the country, if you're lucky enough to get into the country and through the four government national departments that have to agree which skills they're going to allow into the country, you then have to promise um, to abide by the law where 40% of your staff only can be foreigners from day one, which is also ridiculous. Um, the bottom line is we, we're not getting too many startups or nearly sufficient investment in South Africa today. So let me stop there by saying this is a critical issue. Ricardo, 
I'm sure in his other patient countries says that this is the $100 bill lying on the sidewalk and we should just pick it up. People who've been trained elsewhere, who other countries have paid to, to qualify in all sorts of ways, it's like a different form of foreign direct investment and we should grab it. But unfortunately, my country doesn't see it that way. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Anne. I think you make the case very persuasively. Thanks also for letting us know. I've, I'd always wonder where the initial impetus came for all that good South African wine. Now we know. Um, I would say it's my favorite wine if I didn't come from a wine producing country that competes on the same shelves in New York or London with South African wine. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's room for both of us. <laughs> um, thank you, Anne. I am going to move on now to, um, to hand the floor to the Deputy Prime Minister of Albania. As Ricardo said, uh, Albania is a country that has taken tremendous steps forward in the process of, of reform and, and positive change. And, uh, you know, it's a country that's collaborated quite closely since 2013 with the Growth Lab. So, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, we're very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts on both your collaboration and on the challenges ahead for your country. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Andres, dear Ricardo, and Andres, dear friends. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be part of this launching event today and inspiring conversations with distinguished friends and uh, colleagues. We've had the rewarding opportunity of working together with Ricardo for many years. Um, we were one of the patients and I'm delighted to see that the growth lab is growing by establishing a presence there in UK. I definitely remain very hopeful that we'll see the growth labs offsprings in other parts of the world. Why not including Albania again, where I'm from? Uh, when you do it once, you learn how to do it again and definitely better. Albania and the Growth Lab have a special relationship that no matter where we are, we have strong feelings of affection for each other. When Ricardo asked me to attend and speak at today's event, I actually went back on the journey that we uh, have taken together. The past nine years have been transformative for Albania. We were from a country which was at the brink of collapse due to large arrears, to private sector, a large fiscal deficit, an electricity crisis, a failed growth model that relied heavily on construction and remittances. And all of that amidst a Euro crisis to a country that was able to restore its macroeconomic stability without recession, undertake transformative reforms in priority areas such as energy, fiscal policy, and turning around the growth rates by creating an export-led sustainable growth model. Today, I can proudly say that together with Ricardo and his team, we actually changed the failed model into a growth successful model. When things go well, why fix them? We thought that we had created something that worked and that needed to be maintained. Then natural and man-made disasters hit Albania. The first two came in the form of major earthquakes in fall of 2019. The third came in the form of a pandemic COVID-19. And the fourth is already materializing as we speak due to the war in Ukraine. So the question in front of us is what have we learned so far and what do we need to learn to weather crisis and move towards economic recovery? The first message that I'd like to share with you is about preserving gains and being smart about reforms. Uh, to give you some flavor of the context in Albania, when the, earthquake, when the earthquakes hit in September and November 2019, 200,000 people out of a population of almost 3 million spread out across 11 municipalities, including the capital, Tirana, uh, were affected. The November 2019 earthquake was the strongest uh, Albania had experienced in the last 45 years. Then the pandemic came and everyone is familiar with that. In dealing with the situation after the earthquake and the COVID-19 pandemic, policies undertaken by our government played a key role in preserving lives and livelihood, 
and paving the, wall, uh, the way for economic recovery. We tinkered with monetary, fiscal, and macro prudential policies, including adapting significant incentives to cushion the double blow suffered by the domestic economy. These policies aimed at increasing consumption and investment and maintaining the, country, the country's financial stability. In fall 21, one year and a half after the outbreak of the pandemic, economic activity recovered with growth projections reaching 7.6% of GDP in 2021. And this year, growth is expected to be around 4.1%. What is important to note is that the economic recovery did not happen in a vacuum. The hard work in laying down strong foundations in the previous years definitely paid off. The resurgent growth was also accompanied by an increase in, in employment. However, despite the early cautious enthusiasm, and I'm not yet addressing the impact of the new situation imposed by the war in Ukraine, we were aware that we could not stop there but we need to focus on many reforms, and I mentioned some. We need to continue with the fiscal consolidation. The goal for the reform is to prepare the country for, for future shocks. We're ambitious about increasing tax revenues and improving tax administration, reducing the informality, as well, definitely, as keeping budget deficit and public debt under control. The second one is institutional strengthening. We remain committed to implementing the comprehensive justice and rule of law reform that we launched in 2016, a unique and a very successful one, actually. Uh, the third one is the competitive and the green economy. One of the biggest challenges in the medium term in our recovery plan is to create a competitive economy uh, that will be able to face the challenges of the future. Towards that end, we're planning a very careful and transparent program of public investments to finance strategic projects, projects in road, infrastructure, port, airport, water, health, education, agriculture, and rural development. As we speak today, we're building two new airports, two ports, and by the way, only in a year and a half, we uh, practically have built 167 new schools. Uh, we're also very interested in making domestic firms more competitive, and especially about fostering productivity. Lastly, but not least, we think that the transformation of the economy into a green one is an integral, integral part of the recovery plan. In this regard, our government is focused on create, creating conditions for green investments. And we are laying uh, down some really interesting measures, including smart growth, the development of an economy based on knowledge and innovation. We, as uh, we speak, we're now establishing uh, the legislation for techno parks and also some very good aggressive programs for uh, teaching the young uh, uh, population coding. Then promoting more efficient use of resources and definitely as uh, 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 Professor Velasco actually mentioned, in uh, inclusiveness, creating a high employment, employment economy which will enable social and territorial cohesion. A takeaway on this front is that the recovery policies and reforms gave results because they rested on strong foundations laid out previously, but they also called for further adaption to changing circumstances. As Stiglitz says, it's not just about adapting reforms, but knowing what reforms to adapt, when and at what pace. The second message that I'd like to share with you is uh, investment, investing on people. Early in our tenure, we learned that to grow, we need to build more capabilities. And that, as Ricardo says, it's easier to move brains than to move knowledge into brains. Accumulating more capabilities through know-how is the essence of growth, and that means investing on people. Since that get-go, we focused on our human capital and knowledge diffusion, starting with specific programs, improving education, vocational training, and employment as well as creating robust linkage with our large diaspora. Ricardo mentioned uh, it at the, at the uh, opening words, but Albania per capita has one of the largest diasporas in the world. About a third of our population lives abroad where they pursue their professional lives. According to our data, almost all of them 
would like to be engaged in developments at home. Therefore, it is in our interest to create conditions whereby diaspora contributes to economic development. We have now ample evidence from our experience and Ricardo has written about this as well, that if engaged diaspora leads to more entrepreneurship and employment creation at home. Some of the most successful enterprises in Albania, especially in high tech, whether in exporting industries or hospitality service, services either, and I invite you to see those, are led by return diaspora. They have contributed with productive know-how, knowledge of foreign markets, and expertise on pressing issues. During COVID-19, for instance, Albanian doctors abroad, and there are many and very successful, mobilized and offered their expertise in dealing with the crisis. Prime Minister Rama has been persistent in his attempts to attracting Albanian talents abroad, and we have instituted programs in the government to attract high-skilled Albanians to work in our administrations. We now uh, uh, have unfolded a program called Gati for Shiprin, Ready for Albania, that actually is helping uh, many talented Albanians from abroad to contribute. To summarize the experience of dealing with the past crisis, informs us that we can't take progress for granted. We have to preserve the gains that we have attained through sacrifices. And in Albania, there were many sacrifices. And as a result, fine tune policies and reforms and accumulate more know-how to building capabilities and diversifying our economy. Uh, as a conclusion, I'd like to endorse the theme of this conversation that we're having about knowledge diffusion. The new situation imposed by the war in Ukraine adds another layer of complexity to an already very complicated world, which can be addressed through greater collaboration between fine academic centers uh, as yourself and policymakers. So in this spirit, I'd like to end my remark with a call about accelerating it and ensuring that know-how flows to where it is needed most. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister for those inspiring words. I think I'm going to join my friend Ricardo here in simply saying how, uh, how impressive that work is that you've been doing, you and your government have been doing, uh, you know, and, and, and the forward motion in the last decade or so has been truly, truly, uh, uh, not just impressive, but probably also an, a, a worthwhile object of study and imitation. And, um, you know, we very much look forward to having another opportunity to, um, to work with your government. With great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me now um, turn to a friend from our corner of the world. Uh, I introduced her already. Um, let me just remind you uh, that Isabel uh, San Malo was the vice president of Panama a country that has also worked uh, at some length with the Growth Lab. And Isabel, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. And again, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Andres, Ricardo, Miguel. It's always a pleasure uh, to, to be with you and to have the opportunity of participating at, at this launch of this mm -hmm. uh, uh, collab is fantastic. I, I joined this request and recommendation to have something in the Global South. Uh, mm -hmm. But anyhow, let me just uh, mention a little, a little bit about my country so that our viewers are situated. We are a very small country in Central America, 4.3 million people. Uh, one of the top 10 fastest growing economies between 2005 and 2015. We are mostly a service economy, uh, given our geographic location, which is a uh, uh, privilege. We have, we're home to the Panama Canal. Our service sector related to the canal is very, is very large. So in terms of exports, our exports of services are quite larger than our exports of goods. And in that level, we are at the, at the level of OECD countries uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. So as I was, uh, Vice President and Foreign Minister, I had the opportunity of, of looking at some of the, of the situations in, in my country that were a problem. And we knew then that given that we were a country growing, stable, politically stable, secure, we were attracting many, many migrants. We, we have for many years and we were at that point in time, which provided 
very specific problems for our economy. These migrants who did not have working permits, but who were working in our countries, were not contributing to social security, were not contributing to taxes, and they were at the end unfair competition because they were hired by companies and these companies could offer services at a lower cost than their competitor companies. So it was not good in any sense. So there I was in 2017 reading the newspaper in Panama when I see that the growth lab of Harvard had been doing this work in Panama. So I cannot take credit for bringing Ricardo and his team to, to Panama. Uh, and they were saying a whole new reason that I was not aware of, of why Panama needed to ensure that we provided working permits and attracted some kinds of, some kinds of specific skills. So as I read this and learned about this study, my team reached out to Ricardo's team at Harvard University and we were able to connect. And as we were reviewing uh, the study, it, it turns out that it was very clear, according to their research, that this amazing growth that Panama had for so many years could not be sustained unless we attracted to our country specific skills that we did not have, that we still do not have. So this growth model, which has worked in Panama for a very long time, had come to a peak. And we needed, if we wanted to continue to grow, we needed to shift into other economic sectors, other more sophisticated economic sectors for which we did not have enough manpower. And the only way of doing that, according to the research, was to get these skills from uh, foreign workers. Now, I had been trying as vice president and foreign minister to make some reforms in, in, in terms of migration, not thinking about this, but thinking of the other costs that I mentioned earlier of many workers within the country not contributing to taxes, not contributing to the social security and creating or another whole set of problems. So I decided to invite them to cabinet because then with all of this powerful information from a very knowledgeable doctor, I was going to be able to make the changes that we needed to make. So there we were, um, they came to cabinet, made the presentation and I am very sorry to say that even though I tried, uh, we were not able uh, to have a more really turning point reforms done. We did some minor adjustments through decree and just because of the internal opposition that there is to, to migration in my country as, 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 as it exists in, in many others. Panamanians, we've said many times um, that we are the Singapore of Latin America, and I guess we should uh, maybe say we would like to be the Singapore of Latin America because we may have the growth numbers, but we have very, very serious problems with poverty and inequality. And, and there are some important challenges in terms of development that we need to, to change. But unless we are able to attract and retain those high skilled workers that uh, the growth lab uh, referred to, we will just not be able to, to make those uh, transformations. So I am, I regret to say that in, in, in my case, uh, even though some of us pushed, the patient did not observe yet the doctor's recommendations. Uh, small changes have been made. We need to continue to push for more changes. The, the most dramatic thing of my country is that not necessarily, I mean, we could go out and look for the skilled workers, but we have at home many of the skilled workers already. We do just do not provide them permits. And we have those skilled workers because we've been successful are implementing some special economic regimes in Panama that have attracted multi multinationals, that have attracted a global a class, world-class corporations, that have some special permits to bring workers, but those workers cannot move from those sectors to other sectors. And those workers have 
families, spouses that are very highly skilled, that could be contributing to the economy and that cannot get a working permit either. So we need the skills, we have them there, but we have not been able to uh, provide the, the, the framework for them to, to work. So post COVID, what I would say, and, and with this, I will conclude, Panama as the rest of the world has suffered dramatically uh, in terms of our economy. We had one of the most severe lockdowns. So our, our growth was, was hardly impacted. A lot of um, jobs have been lost. The country is recovering, but we face the same challenges that, that, that all of us change in this recovery. This is a time for Panama to take advantage of those workers already in the country and boost growth. However, and because public policy is like that, even though it might be the best time, it is not the best time for it to be um, politically feasible, which is always the, 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 the main obstacle because people have lost jobs and there is always the fear that foreigners are going to come take my jobs when the whole argument of the growth lab that, 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 that is very powerful is that these skills will just contribute to creating more jobs and to the growth of the economy. I, I, I am very uh, thankful for this invitation and, and I celebrate that uh, this team of doctors have chosen my country for their continuous attention and, and I hope uh, you continue to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I am honored to this reference to the doctors. Um, uh, I had great difficulty explaining to my grandmother that I was a doctor, but not her kind of doctor. Um, um, uh, thank you, Isabel. Uh, and I think that the, the notion which has been running through all the presentation so far that Ricardo emphasizes often, you know, knowledge is not something that is out there. Knowledge is embodied and therefore you need to get the people in order to get the knowledge. That is an absolutely central concept. We're very lucky now to be able to turn to uh, Dr. Alvarez, as I mentioned in my introductions, he had uh, a, a very important job. He was the prime minister of Jordan. Uh, of course, Jordan has worked very closely and I believe continues to work very closely with the Growth Lab. So uh, Omar, if I may, floor is yours. Thank you very, very much for joining us and we very much look forward to your remarks. Thank you. And I really uh, am enjoying this and I enjoyed the, the, uh, uh, the interventions before me. And I let me say, I really love Ricardo's uh, um, analogy of a teaching medical school. But if I may, I will start with that and I'll end with that. Suggest a, a tweak on it. Uh, that is, we'd love to have primary healthcare centers, not just the, the teaching hospital, but sort of primary healthcare centers all over the world so that uh, we can create the the vaccine environment, the awareness environment, the uh, the kind of avoiding coming to the hospital environment, uh, and I'll come to that in a, a in, in the closing because I think what Isabel um, was discussing this tension between the politics and the policy of migration uh, is serious, and we need there are certain models we need to avoid and certain models we need to adopt. So how do we work around around that? Um, very briefly, um, um, I mean, you know, Jordan is a small country in a troubled neighborhood. Uh, we've suffered a lot over the last two decades because of wars, uh, uh, closed trade routes through Syria and Iraq or Palestine, Israel problems, the Gulf to the south, uh, highly subsidized uh, sectors. Uh, so. Um, it, it's a very, very hard for a country like that to figure out um, how to grow, if you will. Um, uh, let alone that, not only were we in a troubled neighborhood, but the, the, the externalities or uh, essentially receiving around 20% of Jordan's population in refugees from Syria and before that Iraq, etc. So what do we, and, and I, at the time, the first time I've 
I've started looking at this. I was not in government. I was heading the Jordan Strategy Forum in 2016, which is a think tank. And, and we were kind of really kind of scratching our heads and saying, how, what, how do we get out of this ring around us in the region that, that is, uh, we can't export to because of the volatility? And we started by looking at the product space uh, model and kind of looking at, at that. Then we realized that the Atlas was there and started working uh, on that. And it was fascinating uh, how much information we were getting about why is this product uh, being manufactured in Jordan, but another one isn't, which is, requires very similar skills um, and looking across sectors, et cetera. At the time, if I remember correctly, uh, all of the uh, infra uh, the the databases and the analytics were about um, goods as opposed to services, and Jordan is very much of a service-oriented economy. But we still, it was very helpful in looking at pharmaceuticals and looking at manufacturing, and Jordan was uh, exporting to some 112 countries already but really without the analytics that go uh, uh, into that. Now, when I came into government, uh, we continued that the, the work became much more intense uh, with the Harvard uh, Growth Lab. And one with helping us avoid certain major uh, and, and get ourselves out of certain uh, problematic areas of, of uh, public sector, private sector investment, but in really uh, getting a better sense of a, a, a fantastic tool. Because for me as a prime minister, what I was facing was these lobbyists coming in and lobbying for their sectors. I did not have a tool so that anything I decide would be a policy, a, a sort of a, a, a um, kind of a policy based on, on evidence that is concrete. So you'd have these lobbyists wanting this sector or that industry or that product exempted or that product supported. Um, but, um, and, and you can't deal with this in a, in a, in a piecemeal uh, manner like, uh, like that. So it was quite frustrating until we started seeing um, where these priorities are and the um, the, the growth lab helped us identify six priorities, uh, priority areas that a lot of them were services or most of them actually were in the service uh, areas. So IT related, higher education related, et cetera. And it showed that because in Jordan, we had, Jordan had proven over the last many decades that we're a resilient economy. But if you're resilient for decade after decade, but not growing, that's a problem because in, in real terms, GDP per capita has actually been going down. So our only outlet was to export and our only outlet was to export beyond our neighborhood. So we really had to get into more on the complexity. Uh, we really needed to focus, focus on that. And uh, I, I, um, I do think that we made uh, major progress just in the last three years to give you just uh, one sector, which I'm close to um, IT, which is and, and business services, which was identified as the top area by the Harvard Growth Lab. Um, uh, Expedia started with um, two foreign engineers, but we ended up with 100 uh, by the way, engineers in Jordan that are two thirds of, of graduates in engineering are, are unemployed. So we're, you know, we, Jordan is a highly, highly skilled potential for, but not, you know, clearly we have one of the biggest unemployment problems, uh, especially among, among fresh graduates in technical areas. So Expedia was one example. Cisco started with, with 10 people brought in a couple of experts. Now they have 1,300 uh, uh, employees. This is in three years. Microsoft started with five years ago with 25 people. Now it's um, 500. Uh, Amazon, uh, where Amazon is, is a big um, uh, operator in Jordan. 
uh, Alexa in Arabic is the bigger team is a Jordanian team. All of this has happened in the past three, four years. And all of it has happened by allowing uh, sort of the, those who have the, the change agents that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Ricardo talks about uh, to come in and build that dyna dynamism. Now, um, having said that, it's not straightforward and it's not easy as, as Isabel uh, mentioned. Let me just, get, so this is, I guess the IT example is the way to go. You allow these companies to come in to partner with, uh, or to, sometimes they bought local companies, Jordanian companies and, and bought their management and their staff and continued. So that's the real success. But if you ask the general public, there'll be cynicism. And, and let me give you the other extreme, if, if you will. For the last 25, 20 years, perhaps, Jordan has had these bubbles, these uh, tax exempt uh, industrial areas where uh, a, an investor can come in and, um, and, uh, and, and, and manufacture stuff and export, and they don't have to pay taxes and they don't have to follow the, uh, the laws and, 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 and regulations, and they don't, there are no limits on, on foreign labor. So there are a couple of sectors, mainly garment, almost 100% foreign labor, 100% of the inputs are imported, 100% of the uh, are exported overseas and it's exempt from taxes. So the, the, um, so that's a model that has gotten Jordanians wondering, okay, what are we getting out of this? So if you look from a uh, sort of an Atlas approach, the linkages to the Jordanian economy are almost nil. Uh, and uh, the return, uh, the value added, et cetera is, is, and the sophistication is not that high. You know, there's garment and a few other food products, etc. So Jordan did not, I really don't think that was the right model um, to follow. And in the rest of the economy, the economy was getting used to attracting unskilled foreign labor in agriculture, in construction, in manufacturing, unskilled. Um, and G Jordan got stuck in this vicious uh, cycle of uh, low equilibrium, low wage, low technology, low uh, productivity uh, of, of workers. So the, the Jordan was uh, not doing what the growth lab was suggesting is to, to find ways to attract highly skilled, highly skilled workers in key sectors that, that, can, be, um, that can be transformative. So yes, I think it can be done. Uh, yes, I think it to a country, a small country like Jordan, it's our only way to uh, leapfrog, if you will, from the uh, troubled neighborhood around us and and be able to reach Europe and other countries, which we already are, but very small ways. And um, in that sense, I go back and I'll I'll stop here. I'll I'll go back to where Ricardo started uh, from with. Uh, uh, with the medical terminology, I do think um, what is needed is an on the ground um, kind of perhaps uh, either with, with academia or with think tanks uh, like what you have in South Africa or uh, the Jordan Strategy Forum uh, that becomes, if you will, the primary healthcare provider <laughs> before you get to the hospital and to the emergency room and see the doctor. Uh, that keeps an eye on these industries and opportunities and, and kind of almost um, uh, goes through the, the bureaucratic steps of getting certain um, uh, um, requirements approved by the four or five different agencies that have to do that. Um, and, uh, and I really think that that is something we need to look at and, and make sure it happens. And I'm really uh, fortunate to have worked uh, with uh, many of you um, in Jordan and uh, look forward to more of that. Thanks very much, Dr. Um, Al-Razaz. 
Um, I will remember that um, that metaphor. It is not just um, not just the teaching hospital, but also the primary healthcare provider. We we need both. We will we will begin to work on the latter sooner rather than later. We have about 20, 22 minutes. Um, let me remind people in the audience that if you'd like to pose a question to our speakers, just upload it to the chat and um, or to the Q and A function, and I will um, I will try to um, read it and share it with our speakers. And I'm going to get started right now. Um, the first question is actually for our um, very own Ricardo Hausman, um, and you can use this opportunity also, Ricardo, to respond. Uh, to our great uh, speakers' uh, thoughts with any thoughts of your own that you might have um, as you parse through some of those stories and some of those anecdotes. Uh, but here's a question from Niels Handler, who is from the LSE Grantham Institute. And he says, congratulations on your paradigm of economic complexity. Uh, Niels would like to know to what degree have neoclassical economists embraced economic complexity? Uh, and how can one use it in practice to measure and promote innovation? Over to you, Ricardo. No, oh, well, that, that's a, that's a great question. I think um, I think uh, well, you know, the economic complexity papers are having I don't know a, about five six thousand. Uh, the two core papers are, have about five, 6,000 citations. So I'm hoping that uh, it's percolating through, mm -hmm. through the system. Um, there is a, an increasing number of papers that are trying to ground um, some of our complexity measures in, with micro foundations. Some of them are postdocs at, at the growth lab. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's been, a, a, I mean, it's fair to say that we've had uh, a, a stronger impact on the world of practice and the world of policy making and applied work, and it's sifting through back to academia uh, uh, at its own pace. I think um, uh, the same ideas uh, will have been applied to, for example, technology and patenting and spaces and the idea that countries move from the things they know how to do to things that are not too far away in some cognitive space and that um, uh, this uh, this is borne out in, in patent data. There's a recent paper, it's a collaboration between the Growth Lab and LSE on showing that uh, places that have started patenting um, uh, recently uh, have been, um, uh, the, the process of patenting was kickstarted by some multinational that started patenting in the, in the country and that the effect is larger for medium-sized multinationals rather than champion multinationals, because apparently the champion multinationals are able to internalize the knowledge and it doesn't spill over. In the medium-sized multinationals tend to be more collaborative and, and spread the knowledge out. So, so that's a recent paper that's uh, coming out. And, uh, but in general, I think that uh, it's been, uh, I mean, the, the response in academia is, is, is growing. Um, let me let me say that some of the uh, the ideas on on uh, you know the role of uh, of some of the mechanisms of uh, complexity upgrading and so on were first I mean it, it's quite amazing to to realize examples uh, the Prime Minister Al Razaz mentioned uh, these were companies. Where the law in Jordan says that you cannot be a foreigner and, a, and an engineer in, and work as an engineer in Jordan unless uh, you find an exception, right? So, <laughs> so, and the exception probably involves, you know, some, you know, you have to talk to a king eventually. Uh, but, um, uh, but the thing is that uh, when you do find, you know, one, uh, an exception, it has huge effects. And in my mind, that's an incredible demonstration effect. And, and in, in, in Panama, we found the same thing, that we found these exceptions. As I like to say, Panama has a policy that closes its door to immigration, but opens two windows on the third floor. So if you want to get in, you have to climb through the walls, right? In, but they do have those exceptions. So we, it's, it's perfect because then we can analyze those exceptions, the impact of those exceptions, and they're huge. They're huge. Um, so, 
um, I'm very much uh, uh, impressed at, at this idea that, you know, there is, there is a world where you can think that if, if you think that if people come in, they, are, they increase uh, unemployment. If they go out, they reduce unemployment, right? So I can imagine that uh, there must be a model that suggests that if Elon Musk, uh, thanks to the fact that Elon Musk has left South Africa, uh, unemployment is down by one, right? <laughs> 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 that's unlikely to be the case, right? So, um, so uh, all of these uh, examples from from these countries uh, um, uh, are very, very um, meaningful. Let me let me mention uh, 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 in Albania uh, the labor force uh, increased by five percent over the course of two years because of return migrants from Greece. And these return migrants from Greece were not coming because of the boom in Albania. They were coming because of the catastrophe in Greece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they were pushed more than they were pulled. Now, if you put that in a standard uh, economic model, you would say you increase the supply of labor uh, by big amounts. Uh, two things uh, uh, might happen. One is that uh, unemployment goes up, maybe because some wage rigidity prevents a price adjustment, or, or there is no wage rigidity, and as a consequence, there's no increase in unemployment because wages decline. So what we found is that uh, uh, unemployment went down and wages went up, and employment of the nationals went up. And when we analyzed in detail what had happened, the people that had come from Greece had come with, for example, knowledge of working, doing agriculture with greenhouses. And in the process of developing their greenhouses in their small plots, they had to hire their neighbors and so on to uh, make it into a more commercial agricultural farm. And, or they came and opened up, um, they had worked in the hospitality industry in Greece and came back with knowledge of, of working in hospitality and, 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 and did their thing in, in Albania. So, so it, it is, uh, very telling how uh, the examples that uh, that uh, we found in, in 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 the countries represented here are really the source origin of the idea that knowledge diffusion is important and it happens through these narrow channels, and that a lot of the policies were designed in ignorance of those channels. So I'm, um, you know, we need to continue pushing on these ideas. Uh, uh, the, the U.S. has a policy that you know, is, in some sense, it empowers students with the ability to stay in the country for a while. Um, and so uh, imagine you tell people, if you come and study here, we might give you a work permit for a few years, right? So, and then it also empowers companies with the ability of finding a, a talent abroad and bringing it in. So it's a very... It's, it's a very decentralized process of identifying talent and bringing it in. It's universities identifying talent, it's corporations identifying talent, and so on. It, it, those policies are completely absent in the developing world. And, uh, and you know, it, it's uh, something we, we should uh, think about. Let me just finish with this, these numbers. In my mind, in my mind they're mind-boggling. 54% <laughs> of the STEM workers in Silicon Valley, 54% of the STEM workers in Silicon Valley um, are foreigners. And, and the other 46% are not Californians. Mm -hmm. Even though California is a country of 40 million people, bigger than Colombia, than Chile or Venezuela or Albania or Jordan, mm -hmm. only 18% are Californians. If they had our immigration policies, uh, you have completely outlawed the possibility of anything looking like a Silicon Valley. And I think uh, uh, we just are not complete, fully aware of, of the magnitude of the distortion that these policies create. Thanks, Ricardo. Thanks, everyone. Uh, let me propose the following thing. We have about 12 minutes left, 13 minutes left. I'm going to read three or four questions that have come in. Uh, and rather than posing each question to any one of our speakers, um, I, I will offer the floor um, to each one of them uh, in a quick round, maybe a couple minutes, minutes each. 
so that you can address any question that uh, tickles your fancy uh, or add any remarks that, uh, that would be appropriate uh, at this point. So here go the questions. Um, first one is from uh, the University of Tirana, um, Anissa Plepi, who has a PhD there. Uh, the question is sort of long, so I'm going to summarize it. Uh, the, the process of knowledge diffusion would seem to have two stages. One is you get the migrant, uh, maybe a person from diaspora to come back, and then you ensure that that knowledge uh, gets around. It, it doesn't stay basically in that one person, but is diffused throughout uh, the economy and society. So the question is, first of all, how does one make sure that the second bit happens, so that uh, knowledge is in fact diffused around the country? And secondly, what happens when you get a shock, for instance, the pandemic, and the kinds of skills that you need change? Uh, how do you adjust your immigration policies to account for that? That's question number one. Question number two is from Juan Afanador Parra, who's a student uh, in the MPP here at the, at the LSE. And he says that industrial policies fell into disgrace because of government failures and because um, in many countries, the investment promotion agencies really failed to attract more complex industries. Might it be that that kind of intervention is not sufficient and you need another kind of intervention, deeper government intervention? If so, what might that be? Question number three is from Bethany Carter, who's a year two MPA student here at, uh, at the LSE. Um, she is curious to know how panelists respond to those critics, perhaps, um, whether from the green growth camp or the degrowth camp or the post growth camp, who say economic growth is the problem, not the solution, because it strains ecological resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So once we account for the environmental impacts of growth, do we really want that much growth? Uh, what kind of growth? Um, Again, uh, for people in positions of policymaking on the panel, what do we have to say about that? And the last one is from Melody, who is a student at the University of Suriname. As you can see at the LSE, we're very proud that we get questions from all over the world in these, uh, in these events, and today is not an exception. Uh, and this is a question more about South Africa. Melody is wondering, uh, whether in the context of the South African um, ethnic diversity, um, whether it is an issue uh, if the skilled labor migration comes from, from, in, from for instance, sorry, from uh, the white countries or, of the West or from India, uh, might this be welcome? Might this be an issue? Uh, and if it is an issue, how do we get around it? Uh, and we've got one last question from Maria Jose Lopez Signorelli, who is a development uh, management candidate also at the LSE. Uh, Maria Jose would like to know uh, about subnational growth diagnostics. We've talked about countries, but uh, the Growth Lab has done subnational work. Uh, maybe Ricardo or Miguel can tell us a bit, a little bit about that. Uh, that's, I think, as many questions as we have time uh, to tackle. Um, I'm going to turn it over to speakers, maybe a couple minutes each, uh, and that includes uh, Ricardo and Miguel uh, after our four guests. So Anne, uh, we'll keep the same order as the first time around. Anne, over to you. Well, thank you. Um, let me pick up two issues. The one is the, the question from Suriname. Yes, uh -huh. the issue is absolutely, South Africa is a country where race is very important because of our terrible history of apartheid. Strangely enough, more skilled immigrants from, let's call it European countries, tend to fit into the society better than a lot of immigrants from Africa or Asia, which is strange. Um, but could be explained if I had more time. So the bottom line is, yes, this is an issue. We have a, you could call it a labor aristocracy in our workforce that have fought very hard for rights, trade union rights, and um, a whole range of, of laws to enforce all sorts of things in our workplace. And they are a small 
small minority of the workforce now that prevent um, changing the laws on skilled migration, but also a lot of middle class and professional black South Africans who for so long were denied rights, who now have access to opportunities, who, who just don't see why you want to bring in people to compete with them now. So there are some issues of how everyone understands economic growth and the vision for the country to expand and be more inclusive of everybody and the role of skills in that. So that, that's the one issue. The second, very quickly, about people who want to degrowth or sort of minimize growth. Well, my view from a developing country is that's fine with me, but my country needs growth in order to um, deal with all our challenges, because without growth, actually, there is no conversation. And we're in terrible trouble. And if other countries don't want to grow, that means it's more for us. And as the World Bank and others have pointed out repeatedly, richer countries are going to be able to deal with climate change much more effectively than poor countries. So I don't buy either side of this argument at all. I'll stop there. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Um... I am on record as having said exactly what you just said uh, toward the end of your remarks as a citizen of a developing country. Um, degrowth is wonderful, but only if you're rich. Um, uh, <laughs> Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, we're going to turn it over to you now. Again, any of those questions or any other remarks you'd like to make at this point? Thank you. Thank you, Andres. I'll go very quickly on the two first. Uh, I, my, my, my first reaction is that from my modest experience, there are no recipes. It's not that any policymaker or uh, a researcher will come up and give a recipe for any of the questions. Uh, but for the first one, which has to do with the immigration with diaspora coming back and then diffusion of knowledge, uh, what I would say is first, diaspora has to come back. How diaspora uh, comes back is uh, we're trying two ways. Uh, we're promoting the country to them by uh, uh, organized efforts, not simply uh, word of mouth, but really organized efforts. We have seen uh, important diaspora investments, for example, in IT. And uh, uh, if I would quote Ricardo well, then uh, I mean, some monkeys start jump to trees and then to higher trees. Now we could see a, a, a considerable community that practically uh, are doing IT and IT related work here. First, uh, diaspora uh, returnees, and now uh, Albanians that actually are coping well and uh, sharing the knowledge. And uh, here, which is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a step forward, is we're trying to create some center of excellence on IT in order for us to have. Uh, uh, people that could actually take the, the knowledge and go back to the, to the market. On the industrial policies, I could actually quote the same thing, that there are no recipes, but uh, I could actually, it has, it has definitely a little bit with the promotion agencies, but I'm a little bit skeptical. Promotion agencies, they would have to uh, promote, but they're there where should be, should be things to promote or should be realities to promote. So uh, uh, again, here we have been, uh, and Ricardo remembers very well, we have been really good at uh, uh, manufacturing, for example, together with Ricardo, we established the first uh, package in uh, uh, one manufacturing subsector and the, 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 the subsector developed in the next four years, three to four years, it actually went to 54% uh, increase. So again, I would say that there are no recipes, but then, uh, but then uh, as the foundation, it is general term, but countries that do not have it, they do uh, experience this. Rule of law is very, is key to it. And then uh, servicing with uh, knowledge incentives and never with tax incentives. 
I would be against any tax incentive that it, it never produces the desired result. Quite the contrary, it produces less money in the budget. Uh, I, I'm sure that I did not respond to uh, profoundly to the questions, but I tried to touch uh, a little bit of that. Thank you. Those were very good answers, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very, very much. Um, we're now going to turn to Madam Former Vice President, uh, <laughs> our friend Isabel. Isabel, any of the um, any of the questions or all the questions as you see fit? Thank you so much, Andres. I would like to refer to two of the questions. Uh, number one, Anissa's question mm -hmm. on the two stages: uh, first, getting the migrants, and then how do you ensure that that knowledge goes around? I would say to the second question that that's the easy part. The hard part is to have them mm -hmm. um, within the country. The second uh, stage is uh, it's a very natural on the job training that happens within organizations. Uh, we have examples in my own country, the, 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 the longest one, the Panama Canal, which was built operated by a very uh, skilled uh, uh, group of uh, North Americans and, and, uh, and it's today fully run effectively, super effectively by Panamanians. But we have examples there also of private corporations that have uh, come into Panama as multinationals that have established their headquarters. It's very natural to have foreigners who have the knowledge, the skill to come, and then eventually to have locals that have on the job had enough training to be the successors. So I would say that second stage is, is, is it's, it's, it's a given. For me in, in what I've seen in terms of examples. The second question I'd like to refer to is Carter's question about growth being the problem and, and not the solution. Well, I can only support what has already been said here. We need to continue to grow. However, there are alternatives for growing better. Alternatives are there. There is a movement that is growing of profit with purpose of uh, taking into consideration your stakeholders, which include future generations, which mean that, of course, governments need to continue to work on the policies, but the private sector needs to work on transformations, transformation that make business different, that make good business different and that, and that are uh, out there. And I would say that, and I am a full champion of, social inclusion and environment, and these are all possible with growth, and that's what we need. The world cannot afford to leave people behind uh, with that very extreme view of growth that I believe it's not good for, for anyone. That, those will be my comments. And thank you so much again for, for the invitation and the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Very, very well put, very powerfully put. Thank you. We're going to turn now um, to the uh, Deputy Prime, sorry, not the Deputy, the former Prime Minister of Jordan. Apologies for that. Uh, Omar, if I may, let me turn to you for uh, the last set of remarks. Uh, thanks, Andres. And I, I think the questions have been uh, mostly answered very, very well. I'll just uh, refer to the question about growth very quickly. Mm -hmm. I do, uh, and, I, and I think the growth lab always talks about um, sustainable and inclusive growth. And there's a, and, and I do think that the, these two adjectives uh, need to be introduced because Jordan has experienced growth, fantastic growth. Between 2002 and 2008, it was six, an average of 6.5, uh, last two years were 7.8%, but it did not reflect uh, on employment. It did not reflect so much on standards of living, et cetera. And we saw whole regions not affected, youth not um, unemployed, et cetera. So, and I really think, and I think one of the questions was asking about how, what's the methodology of the growth lab. And I was looking at a recent draft on Jordan. And I was amazed that a whole section was focused on who 
who benefit who you know, the targets targeted employment strategies because female unemployment is very high in Jordan um, and uh, in general uh, employment among unemployment among youth is very high and if you move away from the major cities there is also major unemployment pockets in the in the um, uh, governorates uh, so and and the interesting part is that the report re, uh, kind of looked at each of these and looked at complexity issues and a comparative advantage in each of these areas and targeting each of these groups so i do think now we have the instruments not to say just growth for its own sake but really look at the sustainability and inclusiveness of growth i really enjoyed this and Thank you very much and congratulations to LSE on this important step. Thank you very much. I think it's fair to say we've all enjoyed it very much. We are out of time, but I'm going to uh, take a couple more minutes, hand it back to Ricardo for closing remarks and then to Miguel. Um, very good. Well, uh, let, me, let me take just uh, 30 seconds to say, in my mind, industrial policy is really not about, uh, as, as Arvin Ahmed, I said, it's not about uh, you know, what tax benefits we're going to give here and there. It is about figuring out what are the public goods that industries need. There are many, uh, you know, government manages thousands of government agencies and millions of pages of legislation. It, it, didn't, it, it runs them in ignorance of how they impact individual sectors and areas. And you need a mechanism of sort of like information revelation of what are the problems in the provision of public goods, what are the things that if done differently would increase the productivity of private activities, whether there are existing ones and we'd like to create these productivity task forces, mesas ejecutivas, other mechanisms for, for identifying those things. And we like to think about uh, the obstacles and constraints and possibilities of industries that don't yet exist, for which we have other kinds of of uh, solutions and interventions. Uh, I, I won't dwell on, on the issue of economic growth. The only thing I want to say is that education is part of GDP, health is part of GDP, decent housing is part of GDP. And we know that uh, you can live uh, more or less well at $50,000 of income per capita a year. So we don't know how to solve the same problems at five thousand or ten thousand dollars of income per capita a year. So, in the in the middle income countries, it's clear that they are not at the the, at the at the level of income that 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 is feasible, and and we should get them there. And in the process of getting them there, we will clean up the environment and and worry about how to create energy in ways that are uh, not polluting. Uh, by the way, in order to clean up the environment, we will need a lot of metals. So we will need a lot of mining to clean up. We'll need to do some harm to the land in order to clean up the air. Um, um, it, the, the final, I mean, we've been very excited about moving from national growth diagnostic to subnational growth diagnostics. In some sense, we found it to be somewhat easier because in a, in a in a country, you have uh, uh, many comparators that are um, uh, uh, that share many characteristics and differ in fewer characteristics. So, in some sense, it's easier to identify what's holding a region back than what's holding a country back. Uh, and um, but it requires tweaks to. Um, I think the the approach is the same tweaks to the methodology and the methods. And we've, we've had several countries where we've done some national growth diagnostics uh, uh, and national growth diagnostics. And it's very interesting to see how they differ, how, how the things uh, at, the, at the state and local level uh, you know, point us to different uh, points of action than, uh, than, than the growth diagnostic at the national level. So, so yes, it's an exciting new area of activity. Thank you, Ricardo. I am delighted as a former finance minister to hear you say and to hear Arben say that uh, tax breaks, uh, <laughs> that's not what industrial policy is all about. And I could not agree more. Miguel, you're the lucky guy who gets the last word. Over to you. 
No, just two, two quick comments. We have learned a lot uh, from doing subnational growth diagnostic. Uh, one of the things we learned the most in Mexico is this very large income disparities in places that were within the same country and then between municipalities that were within the same state. So it's interesting because it's like forcing people to think what explained the difference between two places, but you cannot quote the legal framework, you cannot quote the political representation system, you cannot quote the macroeconomic context of change rate inflation, you cannot quote the financial architecture, free trade agreements, restrictions to migration, which are typically established at the national level. Now you tell me what drives these very large differences if all these factors that I just mentioned are fixed. And we have learned a, a good deal from that. And regarding growth, I, I agree with Anne. I'm, I've been working in Namibia for two years. I don't think the world will benefit at all from an $11 billion economy that has a tremendous need to reduce their carbon emissions. Now, the world can benefit a lot from using Namibia potential on green energy to relocate industries that are generating pollution somewhere else to those places that happen to be the places with low incomes that have a tremendous potential for green energy and can attract uh, energy intensive industries that today are located elsewhere in the world using carbon or oil based fuel. So I think we need to think about this, not at the country level, but at the world level. And certainly there are places that you can ask, you cannot ask them that they don't grow because there's so much so much need um, in there. So that was my last thought. Thank you very much to all. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, everybody. We are way past our time. Uh, so I'm simply going to end by saying thank you, thank you, thank you. An absolutely amazing uh, lineup of speakers. Great discussion of issues that could not be more important on behalf of the, the LSE, on behalf of the School of Public Policy hugely honored and delighted to um, have had you participate in one of our events and forgive me if i um finish with a bit of advertising we have another such event tomorrow at 5 30 p.m uh, english time on how to boost the lending power of multilateral lending institutions so thank you again everyone and i will see you soon at another lse school of public policy event good afternoon good evening have a good one. Bye.